We're in throes of a pandemic. You have to try and produce a lot of vaccine in a very, very short period of time. We were well aware that this is a public health emergency of international concern. And in the worst week of the epidemic, we might be expecting in the UK, maybe a million people per day become, to become sick. Swine flu has become the first pandemic in over 40 years. More than 150 countries are now battling the virus, which has the potential to infect over a third of the world's population. UK scientists play a leading role fighting this global threat. Dr. Othmar Engelhart has been busy cracking the genetic code of the swine flu virus and developing the new vaccine. Tarit Mukoptehe is advising the government on the fastest way to produce millions of vaccine doses. Professor Wendy Barkley, an influenza specialist, is on constant lookout for virus mutations. And Professor Neil Ferguson is one of the world's top modelers when it comes to predicting the impact of the pandemic. In Britain, classrooms are at the front lines of a battle against a widespread and unpredictable virus. We have had some confirmed cases, and many more that are probably not confirmed. We've had a, a pandemic plan as part of our overall resilience plan for over three years, and initially the pandemic plan was around the possibility of avian flu. Uh, so it's been quite easy for us to adapt that uh, in recent times for swine flu. During the first wave of the pandemic, while some schools were shut, Hampstead and Copthall remained open. We're really pleased that we've managed a situation, we have had cases of flu and we haven't had to close. We get the pupils coming to us thinking that, that we're the experts in the field. They see us as science teachers, we must have all the answers. But science teachers and their colleagues have as many questions about swine flu as the students. The initial questions coming from the students were really about the spread of the disease. Uh, when it was in Mexico, where will it go next? How long will it take to get here? Um, you know, are people going to be dying? Dramatic reports of swine flu deaths in Mexico nearly caused worldwide panic. What appeared to be happening early on in the Mexican epidemic is the surveillance systems for cases were attuned to picking up severe cases. So they were picking up severe cases who were hospitalised and picking up deaths. And of course, if you only pick up severe cases, you conclude that this virus is a severe virus. They were not picking up the mild community cases, which far outnumbered the severe cases. As a result of the number crunching done by Professor Ferguson and his colleagues, world leaders breathed a sigh of relief. The virus in Mexico was much less lethal than first feared. But there is no escaping the fact that people are dying and young people are at greater risk. I'm scared of catching it. I don't want to die young at the moment. I try not to think about the people dying from it because that's just like scaring me so much. Our body doesn't know how to protect itself against one. Our best understanding of how serious this disease is so far is it's comparable with seasonal influenza, the sort of flu we get year after year. Um, people do die, but they're very unfortunate and in a very small minority. Our best guess so far is about one in a thousand people who get ill with this disease might have a risk of dying. In your lungs is where a pandemic becomes personal. Inhaled virus particles infiltrate lung cells, where they multiply and spread to neighbouring cells. I don't feel very well because I've got a sore throat this morning. More than a third of the world's population can wind up sick in bed with swine flu. I've got a thump in a dike. I'm achy. And I don't want to eat anything. But I have to eat something before I take the tummy flu again. 
Antivirals such as Tamiflu and Relenza reduce the symptoms of swine flu by holding back the spread of viral particles. There are more cases in people sort of under the age of 18 than there are over. And I think that has to do with um, in, uh, our behaviour, mixing. One theory explaining why young people are more at risk presumes that there is greater social mixing between young people than there is between adults. The second theory that's coming out, and this is really from a research group in California, um, are looking at um, the experience that older people have in terms of being infected with um, influenza. Because this virus, the swine flu, is originally derived from a virus that spread through people until uh, 1956 or 1957, that people who were previously infected with that virus in, in their young life have some antibody memory of the current strain and are protected through, through that sort of immunological memory. One of the things I, um, I, I would be very helpful to have a bit more information on, if, if, if it's possible, is things like the incubation um, period, because uh, we've had children who've been off a whole... <coughs> People develop symptoms um, between two and five days after being first exposed to the virus. Um, and that probably depends on the dose. So if you experienced a, a big exposure, then you'd probably get sick quite soon. Um, if, if it was a low dose exposure, then the virus is almost, if you like, struggling to survive in your body before eventually making you ill several days later. You feel like hot, sweaty. Headache. Start to move slow. Vomiting, diarrhea. The range of symptoms people, different people get is quite wide. From people having no fever, no high temperature and just a mild cold-like illness to people really being not back in bed for days. Any time from maybe the day before you felt ill to perhaps the, the, the day that you get better, you could be infectious to other people. The concerns raised with me in my class were when it was being discussed in the newspapers about the development of the vaccine and the use of the chicken eggs. They're very interested in the process. Most of the world's vaccine production still depends on the use of chicken eggs. But the prototype of a new swine flu vaccine has to be created first, before mass production can begin. It was at this government-affiliated lab in the UK where a prototype vaccine was first developed. We had the challenge of uh, making a candidate vaccine virus very quickly uh, on very short notice. So we received a wild-type virus, a pandemic isolate, from uh, the CDC in the United States and then within three weeks we developed a candidate vaccine virus. This lab worked round the clock to crack the genetic code of the swine flu virus. On the one hand, we grow up the virus to produce more, to produ produce a seed for ourselves. And on the other hand, we extract the nucleic acid from the virus. Using a technique called reverse genetics, scientists can turn a dangerous virus against itself. Extracted genes are reinserted into a new host virus and are grown in chicken egg embryos and become the building blocks of a new vaccine. The embryo becomes a virus production factory. The eggs used for vaccines are special pathogen-free eggs. The virus will multiply inside these chicken eggs. And so you try and pull out the virus from this almost scrambled egg mix. And then you have to purify it and isolate the, the little components that you want to form your vaccine. If we imagine that one egg is one dose, create 120 million doses, you need 120 million eggs. And so that's, that's not really feasible if you're trying to expand rapidly. At Imperial College London, an alternative to chicken eggs is being developed using what's called mammalian cell suspension. Stainless steel bioreactors replace chicken embryos. In terms of capacity, you're not limited to the number of eggs that you can produce. The amount you can produce is limited to the size of your bioreactor. Some vaccine is produced using this method, but the process is not yet widely licensed. How safe will that vaccine be? We don't want to be rushing into something and find that the vaccine itself might have side effects which we haven't 
been aware of or didn't predict. Using vaccines in these instances are difficult because you have to think about the, you know, the, the risks versus the benefits. We perform all our regular quality control checks on these viruses as we do under non-emergency uh, conditions. What's happened over recent years is that we've gone through a whole procedure known as a mock-up procedure. So although we didn't know exactly which strain was going to cause the next pandemic, um, vaccines uh, actually against the H5 bird flu type of virus have been generated and tested in, in the usual clinical trials procedures and have passed all of those sort of criteria that we would normally expect for a new medicine to pass. Yes, there is always a risk to giving any new medicine, but at least this one has been tested in people and, and is safe as far as anybody can tell. The vaccine they're developing based on the virus now, um, would it be effective if it mutates into the more virulent strain? An easier question to answer first would be about the likelihood of mutation. Once the virus has infected a great number of people, these people will be immune, it will not be susceptible hosts anymore. Therefore, the virus needs to change if it wants to infect uh, this population again. This flu, this swine flu, will mutate. The swine flu virus could mutate to a less virulent strain. But should it become more virulent, there is no guarantee the vaccine for the current strain will work. This virus will select a new version of itself, which looks just slightly different shape than the current one. And we will need to update our vaccine in order to keep pace as we do with seasonal flu every year. Initially, kids look at it from the optimistic point of, oh, school's gonna be closed and they think, yes, great, if someone has it, we're all off for weeks and that's a positive thing. But the reality is when you start talking about this exponential growth of the number of pupils and teachers and people in the wider community affected, then they start beginning to think, oh, what would happen in the worst case scenario? The next wave of the pandemic is the most immediate cause of concern. Emergency helplines in Britain and America are gearing up. A lot of the work we're doing is, is confidential. We're advising a range of governments confidentially. If we feel we're in a situation close to the peak of this epidemic in the autumn where healthcare systems are really not coping, then there may be an uh, argument to make that the costs, the short-term costs of closing schools are a price worth paying. School closure, even if it's targeted only for around two weeks around that peak of the epidemic, can reduce the number by 30 or 40 percent. In the worst week of the epidemic, we might be expecting in the UK maybe a million people per day become, to become sick. I think once students get to the age where they realise that perhaps the, the mutation of the virus into a more virulent strain is what, what people are concerned about, that's harder to kind of alleviate that, that anxiety because that's just the unknown still. 1918 marks the end of... In 1918 is the notorious influenza pandemic where tens of millions of people died. I think the good news about all of these worst case scenarios are that even when you work with 1918 virus, as, as the people in the United States have done so, that virus is still susceptible to the, the antiviral drugs that we have today that we're using against swine flu. Um, so despite you know, the virus's incredible power, if you like, to replicate, if you use the right therapy at the right time, then it, you can still control it. Any new virus, no matter how pathogenic, we are absolutely confident that we can develop uh, candidate vaccine virus against any virus that emerges. Mm -hmm.